And now it is with a heavy heart that I report the unexpected passing of beloved shepherd and friend Bishop Robert Morlino of Madison, Wisconsin. The bishop died Saturday, November 24th, after suffering a cardiac event earlier that week while at a planned doctor's visit. He was just 71 years old, and as you know, Bishop Morlino was a regular on this program and a clear, joyous voice of clarity at a time of confusion. Bishop Robert Morlino was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, on New Year's Eve, 1946. He was an only child, and after losing his father as a boy, he was raised by his mother and grandmother. He felt his priestly vocation early on and was educated by the Jesuits, eventually ordained to the Jesuit priesthood in June of 1974. He would eventually leave that order in 1981 to become a priest of the Diocese of Kalamazoo, Michigan. A brilliant student and teacher, Father Morlino had planned to remain a professor in academia, but Pope John Paul II had other plans for him. He was named Bishop of Helena, Montana in 1999 and in 2003 Bishop of Madison. His tenure there was not without controversy. Bishop Morlino never shied away from defending Orthodox Catholic teaching. He was a tireless defender of life, a leader in the pro-life movement, and a champion of traditional marriage. He spoke out strongly and clearly about the sensitive social and cultural issues of the day, particularly the sex abuse scandal in recent days. He also was a tireless defender and supporter of his brother priests and inspired vocations to such a degree that in a diocese of only 300,000, he ordained over 40 priests during his tenure in Madison. He also focused his time and energy on young people in his diocese, particularly in the thriving campus ministry. When his cathedral burned down in 2005, rather than spend funds on rebuilding it, Morlino opted to fundraise for a new Catholic center at the University of Wisconsin. It is a spectacular facility and a beacon of evangelism in the heart of a secular institution. For anyone who knew Robert Morlino, this is exactly what he would do. Bet on the future and focus on providing a true lifeline to young people and Catholics seeking answers. Here are a few moments from some of my past conversations with Bishop Morlino, moments that would show his clarity, courage, and his ever-present joy. Thank you so much for having me, Raymond, and greetings to you, good wishes and prayers, and to uh, all of your viewers. I just want to say at the outset that I do once again apologize to the victims of all the terrible abuse that's been uh, uncovered more recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't say enough about how I care for the pain that they feel and that uh, I'm really with them in uh, prayer mm -hmm. and with fraternal affection. I hope that I can really help to move things forward so that they will not have to worry that this is going to continue to happen, happen, and happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why I began my letter saying I'm tired of it. Your Excellency, I need to dwell on one part of the letter that has gotten a lot of attention from uh, people around the world who read this letter. Uh, you've gotten a lot of press coverage on it. You target and hone in on a subculture within the hierarchy as the main problem, the driving force of the sex abuse crisis that we're watching unfold before us. You write this, but to be clear, in the specific situations at hand, we are talking about deviant, sexual, almost exclusively homosexual acts by clerics. We're also talking about homosexual propositions and abuses against seminarians and young priests by powerful priests, bishops, and cardinals. We are talking about acts and actions which are not only in violation of the sacred promises made by some, in short, sacrilege, but also are in violation of the natural moral law for all. To call it anything else would be deceitful and would only ignore the problem further. Your Excellency, uh, give me your sense of what you were getting at here. Why is that such a big deal today? And why are so few people seeing the problem and the issue the way you are? Well, there's been a, a desire on the part of some since our Dallas Charter was issued to keep the problem of the abuse, sexual abuse by clerics, 
to keep it away from homosexuality and move it toward pedophilia. But the statistics belie that uh, at least 80% of those abused were post-pubescent males being abused by other adult males. Now, that is not pedophilia. It's more properly a febophilia. It's a kind of homosexuality. There's no question really about that. Mm -hmm. And when I say hierarchy, there's been some under misunderstanding there. I don't just mean bishops. I mean bishops, priests, and deacons, mm -hmm. those who hold the three ranks in the hierarchy. And there have been problems, serious problems, at all three levels. And again, it's rooted in this um, lack of sensitivity to sinfulness. Mm. Uh, so many Catholics believe either that there is no afterlife or that everybody is going to heaven. Mm. And when I go to funerals, I see one canonization after another. <laughs> and, you know, there's no thought, there's no thought of purgatory. Mm -hmm. It's alleluia, alleluia, period. Mm. Well, there's no period. As I say often, I sometimes think that someday I'm going to be in purgatory. St. Peter's going to throw me a key and ask me to lock up after everybody else has left. <laughs> Well, save me a spot, please. Uh, I want to go on in your letter because you, you write this. It is time to admit that there is a homosexual subculture within the hierarchy of the Catholic Church that is wreaking great devastation in the vineyard of the Lord. The Church's teaching is clear that the homosexual inclination is not in itself <laughs> sinful, but it is intrinsically disordered in a way that renders any man stably afflicted by it unfit to be a priest, and the decision to act upon this disordered inclination is a sin so grave that it cries out to heaven for vengeance. Now, some will say, Bishop, reading this letter, that you are blaming homosexuality for the problems in the church and for the sex abuse crisis. You would say what? I would say that homosexuality is at the root of this. There, I, for reasons that I just explained, Raymond, I don't have any hatred in my heart for homosexuals. I don't have any desire to bash them. Mm -hmm. But I do owe them respect by speaking the truth. And this is a very difficult area in which to speak the truth mm -hmm. because the minute you speak the truth, you're called a hater. That homosexual subculture doesn't mean an institution. It just means situations like having beach houses where certain people come and gather frequently mm -hmm. and illicit behavior, sinful behavior happens there. Well, if that kind of thing is happening, that's an instance of a gay subculture. Let's talk for a moment about your suggestion here that, um, and I, I have to return to this, it's made most of the news, uh, where you seem to, to be saying gay men should not be allowed in the priesthood, but there are other clerics who are saying something very different. Cardinal Supich in Chicago had this to say. I'll put this up in an interview. He said, I really believe that the issue here is more about a culture of clericalism in which some are ordained and they feel they're privileged and therefore protected so that they can do what they want. People, whether heterosexual or homosexual, need to live by the gospel. Uh, he added that he would not want to reduce this simply to the fact that there are some priests who are homosexual. I think that is a diversion to get away from the clericalism that's much deeper as a part of this problem. Your reaction to that? Is clericalism the problem? Well, first of all, I would say that... Uh... Clericalism to me means that the priest is put up on a pedestal or the bishop is put up on a pedestal in, in a few words. That's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that. I mean, I know what it was when I was a little boy mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was growing up and the priest and the bishop were on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. Priests today can be treated very poorly in a parish. 
And I can vouch, I've been a bishop for almost 20 years, mm -hmm. I can vouch that the treatment that I receive hardly places me on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by clericalism, and I don't experience it. Hmm. I don't experience it in my own life. I think the real problem, though, here in terms of celibacy is celibacy doesn't only involve physical abstinence. It involves an, an attitude of mind and heart, an attitude which is a virtue, and that is accepting God's grace to sacrifice the companionship of marriage. When the celibate is abstaining physically, what he's thinking is, my God, the Lord gives me the grace to sacrifice the companionship of marriage. My God. And that brings about a kind of a quasi-mystical sense of the presence of God in one's life. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> if one is homosexual, one is not attracted to marriage of a woman. That is, one is not attracted to marriage. And if you're not attracted to something, you can't sacrifice it. Mm -hmm. So even if there is abstinence in the body, the attitude of mind and heart for mm -hmm. someone who is genuinely homosexual cannot be present. That is, I'm sacrificing marriage and it hurts. Some have floated to me the idea, and I think it a good one, to have an independent forensic financial audit of every diocese in the United States. The idea being that that would uncover the financial misdeeds which very often lead to the personal and sexual misdeeds. Would you support something like that and lay involvement being an independent forensic audit? I would. I would. And we have uh, an independent audit every year, mm -hmm. and uh, that audit has is always made public, mm -hmm. and that audit has uncovered, in fact, some misdeeds, financial misdeeds, that were happening in certain parishes. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Um, you know, yes, I, I, would, I would favor that. I, I, I think that without somehow having the key role of the bishop as teacher, sanctifier, and governor, without having the, those key elements compromised, I think we need as much transparency and as much competent, faith-filled lay involvement as is possible. Mm -hmm. But the lay involvement has to be competent and it really has to be faithful. In the mind of Catholics in your diocese and elsewhere, is the Pope doing enough to stem this crisis or respond to it in the way that they are, are, are desirous of? I am somewhat disappointed in the Pope's um, lack of initiative to help the American bishops mm -hmm. do a, an investigation with authority. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm hoping that that permission will still come. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you would encourage your confreres to keep knocking on the door and asking yes, and for I, that permission to, to investigate McCarrick, a Vatican investigation of the McCarrick situation. And so much more. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want either to isolate this right. to that instance because I'm much more concerned now about situations that might be continuing mm -hmm. than I am about that one which has been stopped. Right. I mean, with that one, justice should be done according to God's will. Yeah. But there are other situations that continue and that simply have to be stopped because we're going to lose seminarians if they don't stop. And we're possibly going to have a RICO suit filed against the church by some attorney general somewhere mm -hmm. that may well not succeed, yeah. but 
it will. Well, see, uh, th th that's why I keep hearing people say, well, open all the files. The files are dead letters. Yes. Not only are the victims in many cases gone, but the perps are gone too. I'm more concerned about what's happening today they, exactly. and not little children because most of the charges coming forward, it's, it's infinitesimal, 0 0.2, 0.3% no, of the abuse right. cases are of minors. We're talking about adults, consenting adults in some yes. cases, and double lives being led by clergy right. and bishops in particular. But how That's do right. you as a bishop, how does the conference, you have no authority to fraternally no. correct or in any way discipline your brother bishops. You can't do it. No. And uh, nor, nor can I speak for the conference, yeah. but I'll be, you know, happy to speak for myself. I think we really do need a systematic investigation, I suppose, of every uh, diocese's files. Mm -hmm. Could take forever, could cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. but I think it's a necessary uh, moment in our purification at this time. I think we've got to get the whole truth out there. Mm. And there's no one that's going to come out of that simply unscathed. Mm. Because as I said recently, if they can't get anything else, they'll pull out my high school yearbook <laughs> and see what they can find in there about me. <laughs> but there's no one that's going to come you out. You didn't. Of I this. know you're a Jesuit, but you didn't go to Georgetown Prep with Kavanaugh, perchance, did you? No, no you no. weren't. That wasn't you. I went yet. to Scranton Prep. Oh, okay. And I'm proud of it. Flipping through that yearbook, we're in the, the broadcast end. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I know beer Nin kegs 19, and blenders as far as the eye can see. 64. You look it right up. Okay, we will. We shall. We're going to do a full investigation. <laughs> you wait. I want to move on. Speaking of youthful indiscretions, let's talk about the youth synod, which opened in Rome this week. Yeah. Um, Cardinal uh, Archbishop Chaput, one of the synod fathers, came out swinging early on and said this document is not. Correct. It, its ecclesiology is off. The, its, its, its theology is off. We should re-examine this. The head of the, the Secretary General of this uh, Synod came out and said, we're not changing a word of it. He had plenty of ample time to change it. What is your take on this? The direction of the Synod and the whole notion that we can have these occasional reopenings of church teaching with magisterial weight, almost like many Vatican councils. Your thought first on the Youth Synod, then of the ongoing synod, synodal well, you, process. You may recall that uh, uh, you asked me a question of similar focus the last time we were together. I do. I was in Madison. And I said to you, it's not up to me, and I'm not presuming to correct anybody, but if it were up to me, I would cancel the synod. Mm. And uh, I said that independently of Archbishop Chapu, I didn't know at the time. And of course, the fact that I wind up agreeing with him mm -hmm. makes me feel better about things, honestly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we are in a particularly difficult point to try to address youth in a serious way when we seem to be stalemated in addressing this crisis mm -hmm that victimizes so many young people, not necessarily little children, right. but so many young people. And to see that that topic is not even on the docket for the Synod, I think that it, it's a very dangerous, because if we should carry the Synod out and avoid that topic completely, I don't know if it is realized at very high levels the rage and the anger of the people in the United States. I have to ask you this. There was another story this week. A group of Catholics, whom, some of whom I've never heard of, who are assembling something called the Better Governance, Better Church Governance uh, Committee, and they are going to send investigators out all over the world to investigate cardinals and come up with something they're calling the Red Hat Report, which will be sort of like a, 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 a Yelp, a review of every cardinal and how they feel he fits on the spectrum of orthodoxy. Your thoughts on that effort? People are going to spend, apparently, heavy coin to make it happen. I have a concern 
that since the uh, bishops, the cardinals, the dioceses will not be obliged to turn everything over, mm -hmm. I have a fear that everything won't be turned over very honestly. And that as a result, what they come up with may wind up being very partial. Mm -hmm. And uh, to repeat what I said a few minutes ago, I suppose these investigators, if they're not getting enough from the files, which they should have, mm. they'll go back to the yearbooks. And where will that leave us? Yeah. Bishop Morlino, thank you as always for being here. And uh, if, if, I, if, I'm, if I have anything to do with the Red Hat report, I'll make sure yours has no yearbook mentions at all. We'll, we'll clean that right up for you. Kevin Phelan, Bishop Morlino's former chancellor in Madison and Helena, reflected movingly on the loss of his boss and friend in a recent Facebook post. He told the story of Morlino's ordination as bishop in Helena. Phelan witnessed the new bishop break down in tears. When he asked him why, Morlino said he was overcome with emotion considering the gravity of the oath he had just taken, an oath obliging him to teach the Catholic faith, the true Catholic faith, or else risk his eternal soul. I can think of no one who took that oath more seriously than Bishop Morlino, from the beginning of his priesthood until the very end of his life. And through it all, he remained the happiest of warriors. This is a tough and tragic loss for the flock in Wisconsin and everyone else who considered him a mentor or a friend. May eternal light shine upon our old friend. I'll miss your laugh, Bishop Morlino, and the dinners. Bishop Morlino's Funeral Mass will be celebrated in Madison on Tuesday, December 4th, and broadcast live on EWTN at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. May Bishop Robert Morlino rest in peace.